Welcome everyone from my heart. I welcome all those who are here with us live and also those who will be watching this, um, watching the recording. My name is Padma Menon. I'm the founder of Moving Archetypes. I'm a dancer, philosopher, writer, and uh, through Moving Archetypes, I offer dance as self-inquiry. So I'm really delighted and honored that uh, you will join us today uh, in this uh, discussion. Before we begin, I just want to do a couple of housekeeping things. First thing is that we don't have chat open for the webinar. However, you can send your questions on the Q&A and we will have a look at it uh, at the end of the conversation, which will be in about 45 minutes from, from now. And secondly, uh, it is technology and uh, we hope that the deities are with us and that we won't drop out. But if we do, we will try and come back in and I hope that you will do so too. And if by some bad luck, we are not able to continue, then we will reschedule the webinar. But let's hope that the deities are kind to us today. So once again, welcome. And uh, I just also want to now welcome my the guests, my guests to the webinar. That is Joanne Donnelly and Madeline Martin. Joanne, Madeline, really happy to um, have you here. Uh, and uh, let me just briefly introduce them. You've got their bios, so I'm not going to uh, read all the amazing things that they have done, but uh, just briefly. So um, Joanne has explored yoga and meditation for about 20 years and has a career path based in finance and IT. And Madeline um, initially trained as a landscape architect and has pursued a varied career working in the fields of landscape design, town planning, and heritage conservation. So welcome, Joanne, Madeline, really happy to have you here. Before we start rolling, um, I would like all of us just to join together, those who are here with us and even if you're watching this as a recording um, to join in a little honoring of the body uh, what i call this practice body-led practice and the reason why i'm passionate and devoted about offering it is because for such a long time uh, we have been living in a in a in philosophies including spiritualities that actually reject the body that uh, ask us that that are quite suspicious of body and that propose that the body and senses, creativity, all these things are something that we have to actually transcend. And I feel that uh, we, as we are embodied beings and we live in a material world with our bodies and everything around us, the earth, the trees, flowers, they're so, it's all material. And I feel what has happened is that this kind of avoidance of body or a suspicion of body, it, it's led us to a very uh, tragic relationship with the matter, with the, with the material itself. And so what happens now is that we have this acquisitive um, uh, relationship to matter and we create things that actually destroy our bodies and destroy this beautiful body on which we live, which is earth. And so, the many ancient traditions, not just in the culture that I come from, which is India, but many ancient traditions across the world, um, the most ancient rituals were dance and dance was self-inquiry. It was body led and body was really uh, a manifestation of spirituality, a manifestation of the divine and of consciousness. And their proposal was that it is actually through the body and of the body that the divine is experienced. And so as we are here uh, discussing this body-led practice, I feel like we must begin by honoring the body. So I'm going to do a simple practice. I know that most of you may be sitting down as you're listening to this discussion. So if I was in the studio, we, I might suggest that we stand up and do something, but let's just do it as we're seat seated. So just simply, please join me. Um, just drop into your feet. Open the feet to the floor, however you're sitting, if you could just bring your weight over into the feet, press the feet into the floor. The feet is where everything begins. It is our foundation. It's called pratishta in Sanskrit. It's the foundation. It's the beginning. It's what connects us to earth. So the connection to earth is not a 
uh, wishful thinking. It's not an imagination. We are connected through the feet, through our weight. So just if you're standing, you can really pour your weight into your feet. But as you're seated, just pressing the feet, open the feet, feel uh, the balls of the feet, just enjoy that. How beautiful it is that we can actually cling on to the earth and attach ourselves to the earth through our feet. And then just drop down into the hips. And just move the hips. Our bones, the architecture of the body is made for movement. It's like a constellation that holds the diversity of our body together and is made for movement. So just moving the hips and then you can also move the chest. We speak about opening in the heart. And that's my invitation is please listen to this conversation, not through the head, but through the heart. And as I say, we, it's not about sense making, but sensation enjoyment. So it's the heart that, and how do we open it? By lifting that chest, that spreading the chest, opening the chest to the sky and just moving our shoulders and our elbows, our wrists, our fingers. Look at the richness of movement in our body. There's so much movement that's possible. And just gently, however is safe for you, just moving the head and just breathing. The luxury of breath. We don't need to count the breathing or control or do anything. Just allow a couple of breaths. Okay, so here we are. We've honored this beautiful body, this gift uh, of which we manifest our own divinity, the senses of the body, the smell, listening, tasting, seeing, touching, all these wonderful senses which are here for us to actually connect to nature, the beauty and the sensation of nature itself. So I hope that you will receive what we are going to discuss or reflect upon through the heart because we will be speaking from our hearts. So welcome again, Madeline and Joanne. Um, I'm really happy to have you here in this discussion. Thanks, and um, so it, we are just for those who are listening to us so that they know, we are going to discuss about how you have in the individual program that I offer, Reclaiming Your Sacred Self, how you've uh, experienced self-inquiry, what it has meant to you. And it's interesting that the, the goddess that you both invoked in, in your self-inquiry uh, is Dhumavati. And that was quite by accident because when I invited people to come and speak about it and both of you agreed and it happens that both <laughs> of you invoked the same goddess. And just again, for everybody to know, Dhumavati is this ancient archetype. She is a... Um, a, a, an aged goddess, uh, and and yet she is uh, fierce. She is sensuous. Uh, she is quite powerful, dynamic. Um, but the physicality is that quite uh, earth attached. Uh, that that the body that is kind of leaning towards the earth, uh, which is what we consider the archetypal body that is aging. Uh, and she is the, her name means smoke. So she, Duma, is small. So there is, she's elusive, nomadic, and she is said to be wandering around in um, deserted places or in, in cremation grounds. So this is Dumavati. So let me start with you, Joanne, because you um, invoked, you invoked in the self-inquiry about a year ago, and Madeline yeah, was more recent. Longer, yeah. Longer, longer, wow, mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> so, so Joanne, you know, why, why self-inquiry, why dance, why Dhumavati? Um, thank you, Padma. Um, for me, it really started with trying to, I guess, have a better understanding of archetypes. But then through the classes, your group classes, which I've been attending for a few years, I've found that the experiences were evolving into ways that I hadn't expected but were really quite deep and moving. And so when the opportunity came to do this program, I thought, you know, I didn't have to think about it at all. I just knew I needed to do this. And then in 
going through the list of deciding, you know, which goddess or deity I might work with, I did want to challenge myself. Um, it, I felt it would have been easy to pick somebody that I thought might be fun and nice to work with, but Jumavati, you know, is an older woman and she's not in our society considered attractive and there are a lot of things about her that you might want to shy away from. And for me, it was being able to be in a space where I had some courage to not shy away from some of those things. And so, um, yes, Dumavati tapped me on the shoulder and said, <laughs> follow me. <laughs> and um, it was an amazing journey. And I'd, I have to say, I didn't really know what to expect, but it um, gave me gifts in ways I could never have imagined. And I think that's part of it, that we get away from our minds and our imagination and our expectations and step into the space that she offers, which, as you say, is ferocious, is, is one example. She's fierce. And I think as women, sometimes we're taught we're not meant to be fierce, but she shows you how to be fierce without judgment or without, it's not fierceness from anger or punishment or it's, it's fierceness for the sake of fierceness because fierceness has a place in reality. You can't hide from those sort of things. So, um, yeah, the, I mean, I could go on about lots of different aspects, but for me, I, I wanted to challenge myself and go to somewhere that I thought might be a little bit scary. And at times, yes, it was. So, But having said that now, I have grown in so many ways. It's, um, it's quite incredible. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, Joanne? Because, you know, sometimes when, um, when I see people they might be choosing for example I remember there was this particular uh, woman in the in the program again a lot of you know many of the women that come to the program have long practice they're very wise and so I'm you know it's beautiful and wonderful and learning to to practice with them and so this woman had she had chosen or you know she came to Saraswati which is the goddess of learning and creativity um, and Saraswati especially in modern times is uh, presented as this very me uh, docile, mm. sweet, uh, you know, kind of beautiful energy, and and then we started invoking, and of course, Saraswati's practice, it's got again a lot of energy and ferocity, and it's because Saraswati's energy is like this, uh, the herd of horses being unleashed, and and so you know, she confessed at a certain point. She said, "Oh." I thought I was going to have a bit of a rest here, but mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's, but she recognized that that's precisely what she needed for her creative energy was that dynamism, you know, that energy that was coming from the body as a dynamic outpouring, and that's what exactly was missing for her um, in her in her bodily energies. So sometimes we don't know what we are missing and what we need, isn't it? I mean, that tapping on the shoulder is often, I often say to people, just trust your heart, just trust the first call that comes to you. And, and, it's in, and it's, what is also interesting is when people to say to me, they wanna do something, I, I kind of have an inkling who they're, who's, who's called them. Like when you just approached me, I thought, oh, I think it's Dumavati. And it happens quite a lot like that. <laughs> but Joanne, just, you know, what is what has what is self inquiry to you, and and why dance as self inquiry? I mean, what do what do you feel dance is as self inquiry? For me, what I've learned over the the time I've been doing it is that it's um, a way to get to truths. For me, they're truths in a in a relatively straightforward way through movement and. As you mentioned, you know, I've, I've done meditation over the years and yoga and and in that we're trying to, you know, calm our mind and still our mind. But through the dance and through the different charis that we do and the karanas that we learn, it's like the mind is taken off with something to do. So I'm then free to experience the teachings that come through, the revelations or the feelings. And I know in that moment that these are, these are happening, it's not my mind, it's not my imagination, it's, it's, it's a touching of reality in its 
ferocity or in its beauty or in its um, all the, and you can hold multiple emotions or feelings, if you like, in the one time. So it's nonlinear. And just to even feel some of these energies, if you like, is just, you know, I know that's, that there's a truth in that and there's a reality in that and that my mind has, has stepped away and I'm, I can be in the moment. I feel it in my body and it just amazes me still that these movements can generate this level of um, communication with consciousness is, is also how I'd describe it. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful, actually. That's beautiful. And, and I really love how you perceive the movement of the mind. Um, and that is something I hear a lot. And that's what I sense in the dance too, is that you, you begin to have a really bodied uh, sensation of where the, the mental consciousness is coming in and what, what's going on, that interplay. And you really can kind of figure out when is it body led. And because sometimes people say to me, what do you mean by body led? And I always feel like you, you really have to dance for then for, for, for you to actually sense when you're moving your mind led, which we are most of the time, we are leading with the mind, we're leading with word, thought, and this kind of mechanistic intelligence. And I'm not saying that's not useful, it's part of the consciousness, but a greater part of the consciousness is the mystery, the unknowability, the multidimensionality. Um, and that we just can't get there with word and thought and all of those strengths of the mind and and you know and I respect all practices and I think you know a lot of it depends on what calls to you and everything you know it's great that there is a diversity but there's a lot of focus on practices on what's going on with the mind mm -hmm. whereas here as you say it's like just let the mind be focus on the movement and the and the sensations um, and the mind will kind of you know find its place yeah yeah exactly yeah and that's you know, not something that you can invent or force. It's actually just how it happens. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. Um, yeah, and in that respect, it can feel quite magical, but that's not the right word for it either. And I think that's part of the um, challenge in having this discussion that, you know, so much of what we experience is based in the feeling and there aren't the right words to capture the feelings. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's important. And I think here we come to you, Madeline, because we had these discussions a lot in our invocation, also of Dumavati, um, because you have, this, um, you, know, you have this great intellectual capacity and history and mind. And I remember a lot of that was about this challenge, isn't it, of the sense-making of the mind. So, Madeline... Well. It was so interesting because I came first to Padma's classes um, seeking a break from the mind. <laughs> and I really wanted um, that experience of being in the body and I thought that dance provided that and, I, and I'm a lover of dance and I've had that experience of being able to in, enjoy the dance. And so that was my first introduction and, of course, after about three months of doing a term with Padma's classes, I, it became obvious that there was something else. And this, uh, this world of sensation was revealing. And I was surprised, very surprised, <laughs> because I'd been coming from the point of view of well, it's just a dance class, well, I mean, as much as I love it. But then it became obvious there, there was this other potential. And that's why I sought out uh, Padma's advice of whether the individual program would be something that I could engage in. And that's how um, I started on my wider journey. And it was so interesting because Padma talks a lot about, well, with this practice, you put your shoes perhaps your expectations, perhaps your knowledge, perhaps your everything that you know, you put at the door. And, of course, you're all nodding at that you know, in an intellectual fashion, and, and certainly that's what um, I did. But it was, um, I was looking through the notes 
of our of our invocation, Padman, I was seeing consistently, it took me actually a long time. And this is somebody who's coming to practice with this idea of getting out of my mind or resting from the mind or not be totally focused in the head. Um, it took me a long time to leave those shoes at the door. And um, the, the dance is instructive, like the sensations are instructive in a way that perhaps um, words can't describe and in ways that perhaps we talk about it more in terms of digestion. That, but there is definitely an intelligence and there's definitely the sensations uh, do reveal either something about uh, reality or something about yourself or indeed uh, an aspect of divinity in, in any ways uh, that you can um, be forming that um, idea or sense of the divinity. So I thought it was my experience over six months was certainly, first of all, I come from an artistic background. So I had that love of of dance and I had that love and an appreciation of the beauty of the dance, uh, the beauty of the movements, the the artistry, the way that Padma brings in many, many aspects to, to inform uh, the, the movement or to just point or uh, guide. Um, there's almost a poetry um, in, in the invocation, which is something that I really appreciate. But it's also something that sort of shifts me into uh, a way of attending to my body. And it, it's not something that's like a roadmap. It's not something that's conceptual. And I think for the first, uh, you know, it was months, wasn't it, Padma? Padma's very um, compassionate in that way. She, she <laughs> consistently uh, said, perhaps <laughs> you should drop the sense making, Madeline. <laughs> and, but it was, Hard. And perhaps it was because there was a bit of reaction to I don't understand or this is the way I usually approach things. And so there was a, a bit of unfamiliarity, a bit of uh, perhaps unease uh, about the process. And, and that taught me a lot about myself as well. The fact that I perhaps hold on to these constructs to make me feel at ease or I hold on to these constructs to find meaning. Well, here was another opportunity. And I found that transformative, that, that transformative aspect is actually to bring your attention to the body. Yeah. And, and that's where, where these other things can happen. Yeah, beautifully. I mean, that attending is um, really the word that is used in the practice as well. It's uh, the whole thing is about the attending is the being is the dancing. So we are just attending in the dancing. And you know, it, it's interesting because in self-inquiry, many people, including a philosopher that I really respect and love his work, Jay Krishnamurti, spoke about freedom from the known. Self-inquiry is about, it actually begins with freedom from the known. And but what is this freedom from the known? Mm. You know, it's it's not it's not just by we can't just say now I'm free of the known because yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. a statement. Yeah. Um, and so this the, the, this archetypal ritual practice is about that inter, you know what is the intelligence of this unknowability? Because again, we think unknowability means ignorance, and this is that that discomfort and the and the fear that we have that what you're speaking about, Madeline, unease, which is of course one of the big sensations in the dance is, you know, there's desire, there's unease, there's rage, there's ferocity. So unease is actually recognized as a, and in Bhumavati, which is the archetype that you both did, the goddess unease is like one of her core sensations. And the unease is exactly recognizing that this, you know, steps, we love mystery and, but because we already have an idea of what is mystery. <laughs> mm. 
and, and we think we know what is unknowable because we think, you know, we'll get to know it. It's somewhere deep in us. There is this thing that, you know, one day I will know it, but to really surrender that this is, you may never know it. And the unknowability is the dance, is the sensation, is the deity. And there is an intelligence in that and a dynamism in that. You know, so that's that's that unease, I think, that you know, we, we encountered Madeline and and Joanne too in the in the invocation. So maybe, I mean, what Joanne, what do you feel like, you know, what were the things that in your inquiry that were important revelations for you? Um, there were a few, Padma, and I'm thinking now you've jogged my memory that a mantra for me going through the program was. I don't know, I don't know. And I used to say it over and I don't know until it, I actually felt it was okay not to know. And that, that was a big step forward um, because, you know, I like to know. <laughs> we all like to know. But um, there's a, a freedom in not knowing because it allows solutions to come that you wouldn't have thought of yourself. So that was a big a big plus. Um, another one that came through for me was around a, attachment or what non-attachment meant um, through a particular goddess called Jesta, who I thought looked initially fairly placid. And she gave me a big nudge and um, taught me that being unattached or non-attached, however you want to think about it, didn't mean that all of these things had to disappear from your life. In fact, they stayed exactly where they were, but my attitude and perceptions of them is what changed. So I wasn't owned by them. I didn't own them either. It was, um, they were still there, but there was this sense of freedom. So my understanding of, of non-attachment just, you know, was like a bolt out of the blue. And that, that was a huge learning. And I guess another one, if, if I may, is, because Dumavati's, um, she doesn't really care too much what people think of her and she, she's comfortable in her own skin. And I think I'm learning, I'm still learning, that's still growing. And that's one of the things that has um, surprised me in a way that it's not like you do the course and then it ends. It's just continuing to evolve every, every single day, every single day. But becoming more comfortable in your skin is um, another big one for me. And and that is the nature of a, uh, I mean, how could some, the divine be a conclusion? Yeah. Uh, you know, and that is something that I've always wondered. If you say, here is this template of this particular deity or an archetype invocation, and then here's where you begin and here's where you end. I mean, that's like a set of conclusions. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we say the divine is infinite, but then we always have these neat narratives and stories that kind of you know, have this conclusion. They're all concluded. Yeah. Um, whereas the, in the dancing, I, I always felt there was this, this openness that it, it, it changes and it reveals. And then you, you, know, you find that the same um, deity has these other dimensions that start yeah. and that's why you know, for Bo and again for the way that you invoke Dumavati Joanne is very different to how it, it unfolded for Madeline mm -hmm. and it's because it's also because it happened at two different times so I think when Joanne when you started um, we were still doing in the studio and it was yeah. you know right at the beginning of the, the time the world changed a yes. couple of years ago 2020-ish yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then by the time Madeline did, we were in a very different world. It was a world that was quite, you know, there was a lot more chaos and confusion. And, um, and I felt like in, in many dimensions, there was a much more a personal revelation of Dumavati to Joanne. You know, it came in a much more personal way. Let me just, you know, if, if, you, if I may give the example, for, for mm -hmm. example, the practice of dissolution and ending death ending, which in Joanne's case, it came as Makara, the crocodile or that sea, sea creature that's in the underwaters, which is a much more kind of um, interior, more intimate 
And for Madeline, the way that same dimension um, was, you know, was I, I was guided to was the practice of pralaya, which is the big flood, the great flood. So there was a kind of this more macrocosmic dimension. And because we were in a different time, we were in this time, which, you know, if you could say in an archetypal way, it was a bit like the great flood, this big change and surge. And, and so this, you know, if we can just be prepared for not concluding, as you say, Joanne, that's where I feel that the infinite possibilities happen. Yeah. Again, we want the divine to have, it, no, to hold infinite possibilities for us. But at the same time, we say, give me a conclusion. Yeah. <laughs> yes, well, that was something that I, you know, for the goddess of the smoky realm, um, that, that um, exploration of mystery, uh, which maybe we might call that uh, the unknown. Um, and even that is a bit in relation to known. But um, I know. Something, mm, so, well, that was, that was a big change for me um, when I sort of contemplated the practice is not about mastery. And that was a, a bit of a shock moment. Um, so it's not conditional. Uh, and this goes to the mind and goes to my sort of uh, initial need to understand, to and of course, with understanding, why was I needing that so much? Like there was a real drive to, as soon as it became uncomfortable or uneasy or I'm not certain, there was this pop-up, oh, I, I really, really want to understand that. So um, the point at which uh, in the practice uh, for me was when we discussed this idea of mystery and a new aspect for me was that mystery is not the things that you're eventually going to work out. I mean, how, how is that for hubris? I mean, I, oh, that's I know that's a mystery, but I'll work it out sometime. Um, wow, that was a, also a bit of a shock in terms of reflection of my own thinking about that, um, my own awareness of, um, well, what, what is this? What, what is the unknown? Why do I feel so uncomfortable in the unknown? Um, and I think Dumavathi, really dancing with Dumavathi was a lot about accepting the unknown. And you're, not only is it unknown, but it's unknowable. Mm -hmm. And it's um, not something you not don't have the measure of me is something we've been discussing lately. So um, I think that was very revealing for me. And of course, I had that uh, revealed to me in a way through my own sensations, through my own unease and my own way of, of reflecting on that unease. Yeah. And, and I think that's the other thing which has, uh, you know, a dimension which has really uh, moved me. And I don't want to make it into a woo-woo, you know, thing, which, you know, so much of spirituality we we do that about, but in, in a simple way, it's about, it, for me, it's been the way that things are guided in such an individual way. And, and it makes me realize why things of self-inquiry where these kind of intimate practices, um, because it's so individual, because each one of us is so unique. And it is that uniqueness that makes us it is through the uniqueness we connect to our primordiality. So this is the paradox. And of course, all spiritual practices, you know, at the heart of it is the paradox. And the paradox is that it is through our uniqueness that we become cosmic, we become universal and primordial. And the beautiful way that, you know, we, that I'm guided or which practice should I do each from sometimes from week to week. And I know, uh, you know, Joanne, in this makara practice or this, this um, the crocodile or the sea monster crocodile practice, I remember that when it came to me to do that practice, I was a bit hesitant because I thought, oh, this is a practice about ending. Um, it's a practice about dissolution, and death, and oh, wow. And anyway, I, I came with the practice and 
the first thing Joanne comes in and says, I had a dream last night and it was about a crocodile. And I never dream about crocodiles. And I just thought, that's it. This is what I'm meant to do. And you know, the same things happened with you, Madeline, that you were, I think one, one time you were not feeling very well. And I said to you that, oh, you know, strangely I've been, and I know sometimes when I don't feel well, that it's not really my, not my unwellness. Um, and and you know there you were you were not so it's this kind of and I don't want to say to say isn't this magical but for me it's been that way in which once you open up there is so much guidance Mm -hmm. and we know that it comes from nature from crows from birds and that's happened to you know I know we have shared stories about that you know things that you see in nature something happens and that kind of gives you a certain signal or a guidance. And it's the attending, as you said, Madeline. It's that the quality of attending. And I, I find that sometimes in the dancing, more than anything else, it changes my the quality of my attention. Mm-hmm. It really changes that. I, is that something that resonates with, with both of you? Yes, I, I'm. I'm. What I'm thinking about now is um, how, following on from the unknowability or the ability to perhaps allow, um, there were some movements that automatically, you know, different sensations arise, um, but then there was another aspect. Um, I discovered, which was, say, for example, when I was doing the juggler and um, the retreat in the cave, I was, again, sort of surprised. May I just jump in there, Madeline, just yeah. for those who are listening to us? Um, uh, or just, by the way, if you do have questions, you know, if you can please share with us on the Q&A. Um, we've got another sort of five, five or so minutes and then we'll open for questions but um just on Ma- what madeline was mentioning just for those who are listening the juggler practice is uh, again a, an archi- goes to the the quality of it's the invitation of how do you hold these practices so you hold it with the kind of sense of humor playfulness um uh, and you know how the jugglery is always that multi-dimensionality how do you hold all these different emotions, sensations, realities, all in the same moment. So that is the juggler practice. And and, uh, that's what Madeline's talking about. Sorry, Madeline, over to you. Thank you, Padma, because that was very um, descriptive. Um, So I'm just using this as an example. Like if you told me hold the practice like a juggler, I would have absolutely no way of informing the body or even to be thinking about what that was. And when we did those movements, like it's almost as if the body knew those aspects and knew it in a way that it was very multidimensional and in ways that I would never have, have thought about or created for myself. The actual movements um, informed a whole other appreciation uh, of how I was dancing and how I was approaching um, aspects of, of the practice that we were going through. So I thought that was another, you know, it, it's an intelligence of the body that is really being revealed there. And the same uh, I found with the cave practice. Um, what you're thinking um is that this will happen. You have a certain expectation. Uh, I suppose I still do, but um, but it was totally not like that. And it was, um, it had a paradoxical element. It had a nonlinear element. It had these other multidimensional elements that in some ways can't be labelled. Um, and they didn't have a story or they seemed to have something else to them. And I think um, that also informed my attention. Uh, the, the, there's another aspect to this attention. Yeah. Joanne, did, did you have anything that you wish to kind of add uh, to that? I certainly agree with, with the way Madeline's described it. And 
I can recall now doing movements and as you say, being fully attentive to the movements allows the body to almost, there were times where, when it felt like remembering Mm. And I know there were times, and it might sound a bit weird, but it was like my DNA was being activated in some way that I didn't understand, but things were happening on a cellular level that were also happening on a kind of a bigger cosmic level. And you could just exist in both places at the same time, and that's um, huge. And, again, not of my imagination. It was it was the the feeling that the, that was the body doing its thing in these in this dance practice yeah and and i feel that the the invitation to leave what you know and the expectations is is so that we allow the body to reveal its intelligence of you know that primordial intelligence because if we bring you know i use the word contaminate you know in a, mm -hmm. um, but it is that sense of something that takes away from um, that that attending and the attending is is quite subtle yes. it's it, it's a, it's a very subtle and yet there is a lot of um, power and strength in the sensation it's just because we are not used to that attending mm -hmm. you know we yeah. we are just used to really the, the consciousness that we live in is very loud. We think it's very subtle, but it's when you compare to this, it's like we're living in things that shout at us all the time. Uh, and to come into this, this is a really very subtle kind of attending. And then the sensations are quite strong. And I feel that, you know, that um, surrendering of, you know, mastery, goals, um, ambitions. And I'm not saying that those things aren't important, uh, you know, certainly there is a place for the mental consciousness or the mind-led consciousness and all of those things, but we we have kind of brought it into everything. Mm -hmm. And if we if we are really considering a multi-dimensional reality, which is not linear, not hierarchical, um, not dual, which we which we say it it isn't, but then we also need something to hold that, that is also of that nature, that is non-linear, that is non, not dual. Um, and, you know, because we can't get there in the same linear words and thoughts and language. And mastery is that paradigm. Mastery is the paradigm of domination of the mind. And yes, there is a role for those who, you know, I, I myself come from that tradition where I was a professional dancer and as a professional dancer, you're expected to master the dance. But in, in the 40 years I've been dancing, you know, my whole movement has been towards how is this dance a practice of consciousness? Because we say it is, but how does it truly become this practice? And then it's been really revealing this nature of when does the dance become a ritual or a practice of consciousness? And things like mastery really are not relevant in this space. It's that freedom from goal and mastery um, that, you know, when we all want freedom, we talk about moksha in, in Sanskrit and, and we want freedom, but it is freedom from these kind of paradigms of mastery, goal, approval. That, and Dumavati is so much about that. You know, when Joanne, when you said, I don't care. Um, and that is that Dumavati, it's not like, I don't care, I'm going to be, you know, here to disturb you, but mm -hmm. your approval doesn't matter to me. <laughs> I don't, I don't need your affirmation or approval. And that's yeah. such a beautiful space of existence. Yeah, it's very yeah. much. Yeah. Another, another aspect I was thinking of when you were talking there, Padma, was, um, you know, this subtlety, this other way of attending. Uh, it's also the simplicity. Yeah. Uh, and... I appreciated that a lot with the yakshi practice. Um, just bringing your attention, it's, it's more so or less. Can I just attention. jump in just to say the yakshi? Sorry, yes. Yeah, so the yakshi is again very much, just for those who are listening, is very much a quite a, a, a universal theme across many of these uh, archetypal goddesses. Um, and she is that aspect of the goddess that is a combination of 
sensuousness and ferocity and very much aligned to trees and nature. So that is Yaksh. Sorry, Madeline, continue. Thank you, Padma. Uh, it, so it, the proposition seems simple. You, you, it, even uh, I begin to reflect on how instrumental I am with my own body. I mean, it, they, can, they can be simple things like that, like do I tend to my own body? Um, do I? What do I expect my body to do? Ha, have I ever thought about the body for the mm -hmm. last sixty years? No, I have not. I have not. Um, so it's those aspects as well. Those rather simple, really quite fundamental uh, reflections that can then sort of take you on on a whole other unfolding journey and relationship with your own body and with the way that you're intending in the dance. Yeah, and I, and I, you know, I think it's absolutely true because I've just been, uh, just before this webinar, I was um, invoking Saraswati with um, one of the women and, you know, we were looking at the practice of that attending to the body, that ceremonial attending to the body. And um, it's the body as the, uh, as the ritual archetypal body. And that's the beauty of it. So it's not again, because we leave the minus at the, as in M-Y-N-E-S-S, at the doorway, because that's part of the story of what, you know, I, what we know about me is also to be left at the doorway. And, and I, again, I just want to say that when, I, when we say leave at the doorway, again, that's not conclusion, but we will constantly, as, as Madeline found, we constantly keep on leaving it at the doorway because nothing is concluded here. Um, and that, um, and so the, then the body is the body that is like the tree. So Yakshi is the tree as well. She is the dancer in the tree. And so the, the, the body that the mind hasn't created, that we haven't made a story about, but just like the tree, the body that is just, what is the primordial body, the archetypal body, the ritual body, and the body that has the feet that can stand on the ground, you know, that has senses. Uh, this, this is the invocation of the body. And this is the, the simplicity of it. It's that simplicity of here we are, this body that stands, that has bones, that like just the honoring that we did, that has bones that move, that has these senses that has these intelligence of digestion, intelligence of respiration, intelligence of creativity. It's all there. And, but we all kind of integrate it into this kind of an inert body almost, mm. you know, which is infused with consciousness from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas mm. in these ancient traditions, it is through the body that the consciousness is here expressing itself. Mm. It's infused. Even the ancient deity Vishnu, the name went infused in that which infuses itself or pervades within form and matter. And, and I just feel it's so important that the divinity of matter and body is so important for us. And, and I feel that this distorted relationship we have with matter and, and we, which we have with the earth, which it's, I just feel it begins with the body because when we don't honor the body, I sense that we won't be able to honor earth. And I mean body in that archetypal sense, not my body, your body, but body in that archetypal sense, then it's, I don't know how we can honor earth and nature and, and how we can have a, a, a mature and intelligent relationship with materiality which we all are here. <laughs> so yeah. I, I might just see if we have any um, Q and A's. Let me just have a look. Uh, oh, uh, can you, okay. So this is uh, someone, Nikki, just asking me about uh, information about what I offer. So Nikki, what I'm going to do is I will uh, send you my um, I will send you my website and 
you, you may find more information about the work and what I do on that website. And on that website, you'll also find links to my Facebook channel, my YouTube channel. So there's a, plenty of information. There are blogs there, Nikki. So you'll find rather than me going through all of this here, but you'll find plenty, plenty of information. Um, and you can have a look at the blogs if you're interested in the philosophy of um, whatever it is that we're talking about. I know you were a bit late, so you missed the introduction, but you're very welcome. Go and have a look at those um, that information. So I have another Q&A. Not yet. Okay. Um, so just let's just continue, and if there's any more questions, I'll I'll um, look at it again. Uh, so did you have any questions of each other since you were both doing Dumavati or questions of me or things that you know are intriguing you because your I said that your invocations were very different. Yeah. Well, that's a that's that's the interesting point, isn't it? I think the fact that they were so different um, is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as I said, I think it's because of the, uh, you know, of, of you as different people and then the macrocosm being uh, different as well. Um, so we talked, we talked about um, the challenges, which in this practice, I call them as baddhas. They're more like a blockage or a barrier. Um, how do you, you know, how did you deal with that? So Joanne, you know, when I, I remember the couple of times, one was, I think, as we spoke about was with the, um, with what you just said with the Jeshta, but there was also that thing where there was the practice of poverty in Dhumavati. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm not sure how I, I really dealt with it, but I did it, um, where you invited me to, wear something um, akin to rags to to class to to do the class in and 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 the thoughts that came to me well you know I can do this for a short time but I don't want to be in this space for a, a long time <laughs> which again you know pointed directly to the, my mind and its approach to issues around poverty and deprivation and going without and um, so it was super informative in in that respect um and still showed me you know that i hold strongly onto preferences and my mind will you know invent stories that validate my position for me and i think that was something that more generally came through as well that my mind was really skilled at telling me stories that made me feel comfortable but were in no way connected to the reality of the world or what was going on at the time and um but that's something that again is continuing to grow and evolve and um yeah it's been that's been a huge insight but yeah that you have to kind of you know be a bit brave and put yourself out there and into positions or experiences that aren't comfortable um so that you can practice being uncomfortable feeling that unease yeah and and it's you know this is this is of course the archetypal story of the big seminal text the Indian text Bhagavad Gita, mm -hmm. where there is the archetypal warrior at the most important battle of his life you know losing his um, his clarity, and and then the mind comes up with all these stories about the uh, that peace is better you know and of course he's facing his own family opposite him so then it comes to you know it says you know this is family you can't fight family but this is the mind spinning all the stories just to get over the unease of what was what his reality was yeah. that he was in a position where after a, many years of doing all sorts of things and trying to negotiate his way out here he was and then suddenly the mind has come up with lots of moral and philosophical stories so it's such a powerful movement of the mind which is always ongoing for us. You know, we come up with moral things and philosophical things and the right and wrong. But mm -hmm. really, if you if you go to it, it's because I'm actually just uneasy with this reality and I just need something to get out of here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Very much. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's been a big a lesson for me that the just act, do. Do your dharma, do what you need to do, 
let go of the stories that you're telling yourself, your expectations. And, you know, it will be okay. It will be what it will be. And that's okay. Yeah. And, and I think for me, when, when you come into these sensations through dance, like unease, and it's not a theory. It's not like no. even, even it's not even like reading the Gita, which I love. And, you know, I, it's been such a guiding text and an archetype for me. But in a certain way, it's my experience in dance that really brings life into that text. Because it's like you sensed, you felt the Ani. Yeah. And it's not just the theory of, you know, here's what will make you uneasy. And then when these situations, you can kind of sense it in yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And you're able to hold it in that multidimensional way, in that philosophical multidimensional way, and to be in the intelligence of unease. Because like everything else, unease is also an intelligence. And we live in times of great unease all around us. And, and I see this behavior in the macrocosm, people finding shortcut solutions. Let's go back to what we already have done before. You know, yeah. we just rewind and go back to where we were. It's just, you know, and then, but the unease doesn't go away. It's kind yeah. of, it's kind yeah. of simmering yeah. because it's out of that unease that there are infinite possibilities. It's not by going to another conclusion <laughs> from the past. Mm -hmm. It, it, no, that's, it? that's exactly right and and I think it's in that feeling of it that that physical experience of it that you know that this is this is reality not what your mind is telling you yeah yeah and within that um and and I suppose here I come you know we've just got a couple of minutes oh sorry I haven't been this is this is why I usually have somebody helping me moderate Q and A's and that person's not there today. So I'm sorry that I'm doing such a terrible job. <laughs> so um, how accepting, I would love to hear about how accepting and attending to the multidimensional body can help transform dualities uh, that are so present in the narratives of modernity. Does anyone want to answer that? How does, <laughs> How does multidimensionality help us um, work our way through duality? I, well, I'll have a go. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Brad. <laughs> well, yeah. well, I suppose my first uh, reflection on that is uh, at the sensation level, it's, it's very direct and it's very, um, it's, it's just not just one thing. And I think... Uh, many of the sensations that that you start to feel um they're, they're multi-dimensional that and and they're being held in a way that's that's not this or that or uh and there's lots of other aspects to the sensations which inform perhaps your thinking about um ambiguity or duality or or where is the movement you know when we're talking about moving in one thing to the other you know that's another aspect of thinking about perhaps is is duality what is duality um and what is the flow what where, where does uh where do your movements take you and they're not often smooth or consequential or linear so i think the body and the way that I, I'm feeling the sensations does inform some of the concepts that perhaps we label as duality. Yeah, thank you, Madeline. Yes, I think I think flow is an important word there and, and a practice because when you hold these sensations, I think you said that they might be opposite things sometimes, like, like we said with Yakshi, ferocious, and sensual, sensuous yeah. at the same time. Mm. How, and you know how the, for the mind they are opposing things, but in movement, you can absolutely hold them in the same yeah. moment, in the same movement, in the same flow. And, mm. and all of these sensations, I think somebody, one of the women said to me, it's like joining the dots. They all just connect together. I just want to answer one more uh, question. And that is uh, maybe Joanne, um, uh, it's uh, Sylvia was asking this question about what was 
the how did the the uh, pro I mean how did the program progress for you? Do you you know she what she was saying you know is there are there moments that you drop in and then you know it starts somewhere and then you drop in and some you know how how do you sense that it that it moved? All oh, right, um, that's a good question. I can tell you it certainly did. Um, and I, there was certainly progression as the weeks went on because we built on layers and went deeper. And I did the practice. I think I was pretty good with the, the practice when we weren't in class as well. So I really committed to the, to the process. Um, and so gradually, you know, the, some of the movements become more familiar and, again, the mind gets out of the way and, and you can get into the, the feelings that are coming through. But by the end of it, you know, I just, I'd met this, my next best friend, seriously, um, in Dumavati, who is the safest pair of hands <laughs> I've, I've encountered, which um, and I also want to say Padma is a very safe pair of hands to guide guide you through this process. But even at by the end of the program, we talked about um, this isn't the end, and it's just it continues to evolve. And I, you know, I have my reminders, so I put some effort into staying connected. Um, but there's also times when you know, she'll just pop up and there'll be the sign that we've talked about, you know, a crow appears or you can hear a crow, you don't even see a crow, or smoke. I often smell smoke when there's none around <laughs> that I'm aware of. But, <laughs> you know, so these little things come to you and it takes you to, you know, just, just feeling her energy and all that she has to offer and it just continues to grow and I suspect you know, it's probably, it is different. We know it's different for both Madeline and I, so probably be different for Sylvia too, but um, you just yeah. go with the flow. Yeah. And, and you know, I just, I, I, we are a couple of minutes over, and I think that was something that uh, I just wanted to add is in that, that intimacy and that kind of lovingness because you know, we talked a lot about Anis, we talked a lot about, especially, I think it was also because it was Dumavati and maybe we were speaking about Dumavati because these are her times, mm -hmm. but it's the, inherent in that is the pleasure of movement. So we're not asked to suffer no. because suffering is a, is a great ego hubris building exercise. So there is no, it's not neither suffering nor is it just about you know, la 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 uh, escapism. But the intelligence is some, somewhere that is neither that one or the other. And in that is that pleasure, which is you know, called that soma, which is inherent in, that's why it's a creative artistic expression. Because in the movement, in this beautiful invocation of these archetypes, that's why it's so important. None of this is, um, is random. The mm -hmm. archetype, the dance, the ceremony, the ritual, it all goes to create this space of beauty, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have the ferocity and you know that unease is there, but the pleasure is there, the sensuousness is there. Yeah. So it's that, again, that multidimensional space yes. and that closeness to the archetypes is such an important part of this, that sensation that, you know, here's, you can, I, I even when I see crows on the road, it's like mm -hmm. this reminder, you know, these simple things that remind us of the divinity um, and, and how we learn to attend to that simplicity. So um, I, I know somebody asked me about invocation. You know, someone asked a question, what is, this is the invocation. So it is an invocation because it is an offering. We invoke the divine, we invoke the archetype, we invoke something that is larger than us. So the dancing isn't about a mastery and again, you can do the dancing for that and that is beautiful. But here it's an offering and invocation of some these multi-dimensions, which are divine because reality is multi-dimensional as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah. So thank you so much, Joanne and Madeline. And thank you so much to all those who came, who asked, shared your questions. I hope I got to all of them. And if not, please forgive me because I'm not as efficient as the person who normally does this. But if you have questions, 
please, I will um, have a slide up at the end with my email. It's info at movingarchetypes.com.au. If you have questions or things that you want to share, I'm very welcome to uh, email me. But thank you so much for joining me, for uh, sharing this uh, practice with us and for listening to us and reflecting. And thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.